I just wa first want to thank uh, the organizers to invite me to share with you some of the experience in this topic, which is very interesting. Um, I will take the clinical standpoint as this is, I think, the most interesting point. I, my background is that I'm a clinical cardiologist, so if I don't have all full range knowledge on the radiology part, please uh, excuse me for this. His, this is a disclaimer statement, and these are my disclosures. I have uh, received grants from uh, several um, foundations. I'm an investigator for some uh, studies that we initiated and supported by Toshiba, and I've been on the Speakers Bureau of uh, Toshiba Medical Co Corporation. This is a, indeed a very difficult question I put on my first slide here. The term significant, we're all struggling with that. What does that really mean? And of course, having the position of the physician looking at patients where I want to do better for them, the most important thing in terms of defining what is significant is, of course, if I'm able to identify a significant finding that may have implications for morbidity and mortality. How, how do we handle this if we are taking the standpoint that many patients will have a CT? Well, we try and cope with this if we have some other measures of assessing what might or might not have implications for morbidity and mortality. And those are, of course, that you can measure or try to measure the pressure gradient over the lesion, or you can try some form of assessment of myocardial ischemia using myocardial perfusion imaging. And this is not something that I came up with. These are, of course, the, the guidelines, the ESC guidelines, which are quite complex. But if you focus on this part here, in patients where you start by doing CT, you may identify no stenosis, stenosis or something that's unclear. So in some patients, you are not able to make the call whether they are no stenosis, stenosis, and you are in the unclear area. And there, it is recommended that you do ischemia testing. I'm not going to talk about non-CT ischemia testing because there's lots of other options here. It'll be only be focusing on how we can potentially get this kind of information using CT. One area of investigation that we have been working with in Copenhagen is, of course, this approach where you have in the same angiography information, you get the, the angiography and you get the perfusion. Of course, this is clinically not very relevant because this is, of course, occluded, but you do appreciate a severe perfusion defect here. But this approach is quite interesting, especially if you also do the stress CT. Um, a novel uh, approach here, of course, is the dynamic CT perfusion, something that also we have started working on. I'm not entirely sure where that leaves us, but it's an interesting development that you may be able to do that by, by CT also. But as I said, I'm very preoccupied with how we translate any new technology into benefit for the patient. So we did this randomized control trial of about 600 patients that had suspicion of ischemic heart disease. Uh, they were hospitalized and randomized to either undergoing the routine CTA or CTA on top of that with CT perfusion. And then we recorded the frequency of referral for invasive cath and revascularization and some form of safety, me safety measures of the clinical outcome. And this is just in press and in jack imaging. And these are the demographics in the two groups. They were pretty much similar in terms of, of their, their findings on CTA. About 30% had what we called a more than 50% stenosis. And among those, the CT perfusion came up with almost 50-50 of significant stenosis. And so in this group, only CT was used for guiding the management, whereas in this other group, had they, if they had a more than 50% stenosis with absence of perfusion defect, they were not referred for invasive cath. And these are the primary outcome measures of this study. First, the referral for invasive cath. And what you can see here today is that if you on top of the CTA puts the CTP, you will have a half referral of invasive cath. And so is that safe? Is that good? Well, also we saw that the revascularization rate went down. It was half in the patients that were underwent CT perfusion. And of course, the most interesting thing, how did they do? What was the clinical outcome of the patients? And as it turned out, there were actually no difference. 
So the cardiovascular event rate was the same. And also, even more interesting, the symptom, symptoms and indication of the patients were similar. So here, using CT perfusion, we were able to make the call that these patients did not need revascularization, although the CT angio said that, that was, there was a more than 50% stenosis. So that was indeed very helpful, and I guess my, my card perfusion imaging in this setting might be more helpful in, in the future. But turning back to what really is the topic of my talk is that ischemia testing also may or may not be assessed by assessing the pressure gradient epicardially. This is not ischemia testing, it's just measuring what the uh, pressure drop in a specific lesion is. Of course, there are substantial evidence in, from invasive studies that this probably is helpful in, in determining the outcome of the patient, but I think that's a, a topic for a lot of dispute. Just to um, align you with how this is done, you have a catheter inside the, the, the patient in the coronary, and then you uh, um, advance the, 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 um, the, the distally the pressure wire, and, and if you have a pressure drop, and this is done during adenosine uh, with a ratio of uh, less than 0.75 or 0.8, it is stated that it, it is, this is significant which means that it might or might not improve uh, p symptoms by having a stent placed in that region. This is quite important because this is, why, this is how currently most invasive car cardiologists decide whether you need a stent or not. If there's no pressure drop, it is kind of the idea that you shouldn't put a stent in there. So for CT people, it's quite important to be able to make that call where, if, if there's a schema there, where should a stent be put? And this is why I think that on top of myocardial perfusion imaging with CT or any other modality, I think this novel approach of CTFFR will be of some value. I must say we don't have any comprehensive studies uh, using this approach. I'm just saying that I will be presenting some of the cases that we did, which I think is quite promising. Just a few words on the methods used or developed by Toshiba. Of course, it's non-invasive. You could do it unsigned, and uh, the term patient-specific, I will explain that later. It requires, the, the approach that's used for Toshiba requires a one-shot volumetric CTA acquisition for reconstructive phases, uh, so you have an interval of between 70 and 90 percent of the R interval. And the reason why you need four phases is that in the, CT, in the Toshiba um, uh, calculation, you want to uh, assess the decompression or the, the dynamic changes of the vessel throughout the, the last, later phases of the diastole. And this is in the intrinsic part of the calculations that is included in the, in the calculations. Um, and just a brief word, brief word here is that the idea is that the way or the, the, the location at which you are able to assess or do these comprehensive calculations, this is the so-called wave-free period. Please don't ask me to explain this in detail. I'm, I'm not into the more uh, advanced math of this, but that's, basic, that's the basic idea of this. And of course, uh, you follow this flowchart, you do the CT, you immigrants reconstruct, you reconstruct the four diastolic phases, uh, then the computational fluid um, measurement are done, and at the end of the day, you will have, or not at the day, because you'll see it uh, shortly, uh, you will have some estimate of what the estimated fractional flow reserve is in the coronary vessels. And this is the workflow. You do the scan, reconstruction, vessel tracking, and of course, you need some editing. This, uh, this approach defi is defined by the anatomy of the vessel. So if you don't have a very meticulous a a a a contouring of the, of the vessel, then you're in, in trouble. Once you have a an appropriate editing, you go for the computation, and at the end, you will have results. And this takes about approximately 30 minutes. Just three brief word here. Uh, center line and contour editing Editing is not different than if you do plaque imaging. You need to know what you're doing. You need a skilled operator to be able to, to pick this out and make sure that you're doing it right. And at the end of the day, you will have displays like this where you have um, the possibility of assessing the numbers here. And I'll go through a few, well, 
sorry, just a, just a one word of, of, of you know, specifying that it has already been to some extent validated. This is from uh, Brian Cove in Australia, where he compared this uh, Toshiba approach with invasive uh, uh, FFR. Again, the clinical implication of this, we have no idea. We are just stating that is it corresponding to the invasive cath, and it does appear to be helpful in, in top, on top of the just pure CTA to, to, to add, add on the CTFFI approach in this. And again, I want to re repeat, I have no idea whether this translates into improved outcome of the patient, which is, I think is general, a general statement for any CTFFI that's out there. Okay, moving to a few um, caveats here. The application that we are having currently is not able to handle anomalies, of course, cardiac arrhythmias, motion artifacts, severe calcifications, and of course, previous revascularization. So all of the very difficult patients, we are still kind of in the dark on whether FFR will be helpful. I'm just saying this is in a very early developing stage, and it, it may be that we can do it, but I'm not sure at this current stage. Just give you a few hints or ideas on how this might work. This is a one case with a 74-year-old female, episodes of central chest pain, and the echo will normal. May, you may argue that this is not a typical patient, but let's, let's just advance it. This, is what it. this is what it looks like, the proximal LAD. Some will always make the call whether this is certainly significant, so just go for CAT. We did the uh, CTFFR approach here. And this is what it looks like. I'm I apologize for, here are the numbers, and it's very small, but just giving, what you do is you kind of move the, tra the cursor down, down along the vessel and try and pick out if there's a, a region where the pressure is dropping. See, like this here. So the first one was one, and the second one, 0.97, and here 0.94, and 8.84. Of course, you need to know specifically where you are at in the, in, in the vessel to pick out whether you can have an angiographic lesion that might or might not be admissible for a stent uh, implantation. And this is 0.78. And we decided, we thought that the lesion was 0.8, uh, where we could pick up the, a specific angiographic lesion. And the invasive cath gave us a number of 0.79. This is around this area. I won't, as this displays poorly, I would just go really quickly through this. This is a second patient, um, turned out to have triple vessel disease, 88 years old, and she had symptoms, um, possibly chest pain. And here you have the right coronary artery, and you may appreciate a lesion here. If you just look at this, you will certainly say this is significant, I would say. Maybe not here, but we did the same here, and you, you know, kind of traveled along the, the vessel. This was the proximal portion, so somewhere around here. And of course, here the numbers, 0 0.9, 0 0.93, 0 0.92, 0 0.91, and then quite distantly, 0.84. And we, at the proximal portion, stated that it was 0 0.93, and actually, in the invasive cath, they didn't really see any focal lesion, which was, I guess, similar to the oppression that you got from, from the invasive, uh, from the CT. Here's another one, a proximal LAD, where there's a, probably a borderline, or, or sorry, this is probably, it's not proximal, it's distal. There might be a stenosis there, doing the same, and so this should be somewhere down here, I guess. So we, you just move down along the side, the, and the 0 0.84, 0 0.85, and the invasive cath said 0.88. So, reasonably fair um, uh, alignment here. And then the CX of the same lady, 88 years old. This looks quite stenotic, I would say, but let's see how it turns out here. And I guess this is the lesion. So this is 0 0.8, per 97, 0 0.9, 0 0 0.88, 0 0.86, 0 0.77, and 0.75. And we went parent 77. And, well, actually, the, 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 this is the indicating of where the pressure wire was, and of course there's the lesion. So reasonably good. 
as I said, this is not science. This is, well, this part on our ex initial experiences just it suggests that it, it does appear to be helpful in, in some patients. Whether that transforms into value for the patient is, remains to be seen, but I think it's fair to conclude that the treatment strategy in patients with coronary artery disease, specifically, of course, with the ones within the intermediate range of stenosis severity, if it's normal, you're done. If it's almost occluded, you're done. It's the intermediate range where you need more, and there you want some kind of a functional assessment. Uh, it can be done with CTFFR, probably. We certainly know now that it can be done with CT myocardial perfusion imaging. And I think for the CATS trial, we would certainly try and, and promote that that will be helpful in management of patients. Probably in combination with CTFFR, but that's too soon to say, because what is the contribution of CTFFR is, if there's ischemia, you also need to know, are you able to identify a focal lesion that is probably a, uh, will be able to stent that region? It's not just enough to say that there's ischemia. So, but more data is needed to determine the role of CTFFI in clinical decision-making, and that's pretty much my, my talk on this. Thank you.